All right. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I hope that this doesn't end up being really awful. So my name is Matthew Yarris. I work for Nebula. We do uh, private cloud hardware and magic stuff. We're very, very buzzword compliant. I'm not going to be talking about that. <laughs> so we're going to go back into the past. Uh, Understanding Secure Boot involves understanding a lot of awful historical detail that is, uh, in a lot of ways, would possibly be better left in the midst of time. But instead, we're going to go back, we're going to look at the historical context, we're going to try to understand why things are the way we are, and I'm going to mostly ignore the technical details. If you want to know about the technical details of UEFI, I recommend reappraising your life choices. <laughs> thinking very hard about whether this is something you really want to do, and if it is, go and search for uh, probably the best one's presentation I gave at LCA last year, which would give a technical introduction to UEFI. So instead, like I said, we're going to be looking at the historical context of Secure Boot and some discussion of the social issues that were involved in us coming up with solutions for dealing with a situation where, at the worst point, it looked like nobody would be able to install Linux on any computers you could buy anymore, which given that at the time I was working for a company that made money by selling Linux to be installed on computers, uh, would have caused us certain problems. Back in 2006, UEFI 2.0 was released. Now, the thing about UEFI 2.0 is that it was the first release of UEFI, despite the version number. UEFI 2.0 was a follow-up to EFI 1.10. EFI was an Intel specification that Intel controlled. Intel developed it to run on IA64 hardware. Since the i64 hardware basically never sold, uh, they decided that it would be helpful to maybe redevelop this in such a way that it could be used on consumer PCs as well, um, to deal with the fact that we were already starting to see limitations inherent in BIOS. So UEFI, EFI turned into UEFI. UEFI is a cross-vendor specification. If you want to be part of the UEFI development process, as a company, you can sign up for free to uh, get certain amounts of access to the specifications and implementation. If you want to contribute to it, you pay $3,000 a year. Um, so by corporate specification levels, it's really, really cheap. That should tell you something about how much it usually costs to take part in standards processes. So one of the things about UEFI 2.0 was that it described a method for signing drivers. And when we talk about signing drivers, we mean, well, signing things. We mean that we use cryptography to attach a signature to a file. And the signature is made up of a cryptographic hash of the files. So you, you've seen MD5 sums when you download an ISO and you verify that the file matches the MD5 sum. The idea of cryptographic hash is that it's very difficult to make changes and still have the same hash. So you take your driver, you take a hash of it, and then you encrypt that hash with a private key. Then something comes along, decrypts the hash using the public key that it has, verifies that it decrypts correctly, and verifies that the hash matches the driver binary. And if it does, you know it hasn't been modified, and you know it was signed by someone who had the private key that corresponds to the public key. So UEFI 2.0 does this for drivers, and that seems fine. Nobody really understands why, because it doesn't define any policy for verifying this. It doesn't define a way for distribution of the public keys so that you can verify that the drivers are actually authentic. But hey, it's there. It defines how you uh, embed the signature into the binary. Uh, it looks awfully like Microsoft Authenticode, which is how Microsoft signed their drivers, and that's because it is, in fact, Microsoft Authenticode. It's convenient because we already have software that deals with that. Anyway, UEFI 2.2 finally describes a method for image validation, so it's no longer just limited to drivers, it also corresponds to EFI executables. One of the big differences between EFI and BIOS is that instead of just writing code directly onto your disk, on EFI systems, you can actually run individual applications. And so we can find those in the same way as EFI drivers. And it also describes methods for distributing keys, which keys should be verified, and how you can blacklist keys. So by 2008, we're at the point where you could implement the UEFI specification and you could actually do something useful with Secure Boot. At this point, in the Linux community, those of us who are aware of the UEFI specification, which I think is basically me, uh, and a couple of people who work for Dell and some at IBM and a couple of people at Intel, but you know, it's, there's a small number of people who are even really aware of UEFI as a thing. And 
our interpretation of this is that this is something that someone doing, say, an embedded product with UEFI could make use of. I find that still seems kind of weird and alien, but sure. Or alternatively, it's something that the end user could set up on their machine. So they could choose, well, I want my machine to only boot stuff signed by this company or stuff that I've signed myself. So we've looked at the specification. We've seen that the specification allows the user to install keys. Uh, as long as the system isn't shipped with keys pre-installed, the user can install their own keys. Everything seems fine. Let me go to August 2011. Now, this was the uh, LinuxCon North America in Vancouver, and it's the 20th anniversary of Linux. Well, it wasn't actually the 20th anniversary of Linux. That was a bit earlier in the year, but we have this party. Um, people are encouraged to turn up in either black tie or dresses. Matthew Wilcox turns up in a dress. <laughs> and there's a certain amount of drinking. Uh, this is mostly to add a little local color as opposed to any particular relevance. Uh, but the next day, I'm sitting around on a chair in conference, and someone from Canonical walks over to me and says, ah, Matthew, um, so Red Hat, you've just joined the UEFI specification body. Uh, have you seen this email from Microsoft? No? OK. Um, so I go and I look at the mailing list archives and I pull out this document that Microsoft have sent to the mailing list. And the document describes the UEFI functionality that Microsoft expects to be present on all Windows 8 client systems when they're sold. And one of them is that client's hardware must be UEFI, must support secure boot, and must have secure boot enabled by default. So out of the box, the system will only boot stuff that's signed. And more to the point, it also says it must carry these Microsoft signing keys. It does not require that any other signing keys be carried. It doesn't forbid it either. But out of the box, it seems like hardware will potentially only boot Windows. <laughs> and yeah, at the time, seriously, discovering that your entire industry is about to vanish while you're brutally hung over is just very unfair. <laughs> So, the details, roughly, as I described, you generate a scriptographic hash of the binary, you sign the hash for the private key. On boot, the system verifies that the hash matches the binary, and it verifies that the key that was used to sign the hash is the private half of a public key that it trusts. And if that isn't true, it fails to boot. And there's two things it can do there. It can either pop up an error box saying that it fails to uh, authenticate this binary, or alternatively, the specification allows and in fact encourages you to just fall back to the next thing in the boot list. So if you attempt to boot off a CD that contains a either unsigned binary or a binary signed with an incorrect key, it will instead just boot off hard drive, potentially without even telling you that that's why. And the reason that's fairly straightforward, the idea is if your bootloads are compromised, then you fall back to the next thing in the boot list, which is with luck some sort of recovery image. And the idea is that, okay, if the system's got corrupted, you automatically fall back to the recovery image, which then makes everything good for the user again. And in Windows 8, this actually happens. Uh, if you manage to trash your bootloader or one of the other signed components, on the next boot, it instead boots off the recovery image and then reinstalls large chunks of Windows. Uh, this makes it surprisingly difficult to get rid of Windows. So what's the justification for this? And the answer is that uh, attackers are getting more sophisticated. And there's a little bit of irony here when I talk about attackers getting more sophisticated, because if we go back to the early 80s, the original viruses were boot sector viruses. They lived in the bootloader area of floppy disks. And you put that floppy disk in, and it booted that code. And the virus copied itself into memory and then sat there. And then whenever you put in another disk, it would copy itself onto the other disk as well and it was spread that way. And once we got into operating systems that actually, well, once we got to the point where people didn't use floppy disks anymore, because seriously, how many of you here have never used a floppy disk? There must be some of you. Yeah, well, 
And just to say, I was born in the 80s, so I'm not particularly old, but really, um, it's, the world is terrifying. <laughs> and, okay, so attackers instead moved to infecting files directly, and then you'd execute a file, and it was, the virus would be embedded in the file, and it would then copy itself into other files. And, okay, fine, but then when you execute a file, the thing that executes your file is your operating system. That means that your operating system has the ability to check the file before executing it and scan it and see whether it's got a virus infected. So attackers stopped necessarily just infecting files and started infecting drivers because if you load the driver into the kernel, then it can modify the kernel. So when the kernel is asking, is this file okay? The driver can patch that check out. And then they move to, okay, well, we're going to start putting the virus scanning in the kernel so that when you attempt to load a driver, we can verify that the driver hasn't been modified. So Windows on 64-bit systems has, uh, since Vista, requires that drivers be signed and won't let you load unsigned drivers. So that's all well and good. Um, but what happens if you modify the kernel directly? And the easiest way to modify the kernel directly is to modify the bootloader. So when the bootloader loads the kernel, it modifies the kernel. And so the kernel, again, thinks everything's OK. And then if you get really clever, if the kernel tries to read the bootloader to verify the bootloader, you give it back the correct answer. If you can modify the bootloader, there is no way for an operating system to verify itself. There's no way to avoid malware that's got in underneath you. The only thing you can do is boot off known good media and scan your hard drive. Some people have got around that by um, putting the virus in the system BIOS. There is a particularly nasty Chinese one which is able to infect some systems, uh, some AMI BIOSes. So if you take the hard drive out, there's a new hard drive in, the BIOS reinfects your hard drive. This is really nasty and it's becoming increasingly interesting, partially because people now do so much more of their financial work on computers and so it's uh, vital that we keep computers secure so that you don't have all your credit card details used to purchase weapons of mass destruction. And also because international espionage is increasingly interested in actually controlling people's computers because people now use their computers to build weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so there's plenty of incentives for attacking that and for the operating system vendors, there's plenty of incentive in preventing that. So Secure Boot does have some justification for security. It's easy to see it as a control mechanism for uh, disrupting the market in a way unfavorable to us. And I'm not going to say that Microsoft wouldn't have been entirely happy if Secure Boot made the platform to install Linux. But there are justifiable reasons for Secure Boot as well. So what are our options? And our options were, at this point, it seems fairly limited. Uh, we could try drinking. I'd already tried that. It didn't seem to be working too well for me. So instead, I thought, really, maybe I should try drinking again, just in case it works better this time. <laughs> And well, after that, I woke up again, and this time I felt really bad. So uh, we considered some of our other options, and one of those was we could break RSA encryption, <laughs> and then we'd be able to just generate a copy of Microsoft's private signing key. Uh, the problem is that if we were able to do that, we'd also have broken HTTPS, and so the entire banking industry would be somewhat unhappy with us. And also, there's lots of much smarter people than us already trying to do this, and as far as we know, failing. So that didn't seem like a great opportunity either. It also might have shown you can prove that P equals NP. If we could prove that P equals NP, then yes. Um, but in that case, I would. I, I, I'm not sure if proving that P equals NP results in me becoming incredibly rich and famous, as opposed to. I uh, actually no idea what it would get me. Uh, it's not a priority. So after that, uh, I went back to plan A, which was really through this. Um, I'm in Canada, I'm just going to drink until Canada goes away. <laughs> uh, so I got back from Canada, and uh, yeah, it took me a couple of days to really be able to face things like sunlight again. And decided that, well, you know, we don't appear to have many technical options here. And if you can't do something technically, then it's important to start thinking about what you can do socially. Uh, okay, Red Hat's a decently sized company, um, which means that if I want to get anything done, I'm going to need to convince multiple layers of management, and that's going to be really tedious and dull, and it's going to take forever, and nobody's going to care that much anyway, because right now, well, two problems. First, it wasn't an immediate problem, and two, this was only required for Windows, 2 cli uh, Windows 8 client systems, not server systems. 
and we sold mainly into the server market. So while the Linux community in general might be interested in Linux on the desktop, which I hear is coming real soon now, <laughs> it wasn't necessarily a red hat priority. Uh, um, my general answer to this is uh, when in doubt, cause trouble. And I have a certain amount of good track record in causing trouble. Then in September 2011, uh, a couple of things happened. The first is that Microsoft had their build conference, and one of the things they talked about at their build conference was secure boot and their requirements for Windows 8. So, you know, at the point where Microsoft is talking about it publicly, we can talk about it publicly. The problem up until this point was that it has only been discussed on the UEFI working group mailing list, and one of the conditions of being part of these standards bodies is normally rule one, you do not talk about the contents of the standards body. Uh, rule two is you have interminable phone calls. Go on forever. So I talk about the Windows 8 requirements, and I talk about how right now uh, we potentially have this situation in which computers will be sold that will not boot Linux, and that while it's possible that you'll be able to disable it, there's no requirement that you'll be able to disable it, and this could cause problems, but you know, right now, this isn't happening immediately. There's still some time to work on this. We can probably come up with some sort of solutions. We're just not sure what they'll be yet. And I end with, it's probably not worth panicking yet, but it is worth being concerned, which I thought was a sober description of the current state of things. It seemed likely that we'd probably be able to come to some sort of compromise somehow. Uh, so basically, yeah, it was uh, don't panic. And then this happened. <laughs> so yeah, it's really easy to cause trouble, it turns out. You just tell the world that Microsoft's about to take Linux away from you. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of like telling the NRA that you're going to take their guns, um, <laughs> except slightly less violent, but only slightly. And the great thing is that uh, you know, I'm just this random Linux developer person who wrote this blog post. Uh, and then two days later, Microsoft writes a response. Wow. Uh, possibly because apparently the entire world's technical press had been calling Microsoft to ask why um, Microsoft were going to steal Linux. And also, apparently, some security agencies were also calling Microsoft, asking what on earth were they doing? How are they going to spy on their people now? <laughs> So Microsoft were obliged to respond, uh, and part of the Microsoft response was fairly straightforward. Secure Boot is a UEFI protocol, not a Windows 8 feature. I, we are implementing a cross-vendor standard. Now, this ammunition, um, apparently it's usually intended for killing people. Uh, apparently some people claim that there are other uses for it, but this one in specific is um, this uh, NATO specification. It's a standard for defining ammunition that is supposed to be interoperable between NATO members. The idea being that, well, this way you don't have to have multiple ammunition supplies for every different NATO member who's engaged in operation. Uh, and when you're sitting there being shot at, I'm sure you're really pleased that you're being shot at with a standard. <laughs> Wouldn't it be awful if it was just some sort of ad hoc thing? You know, oh, damn, uh, these three bullets are all from different manufacturers and they're all different sizes. Yeah, uh, standards are not necessarily, it's not very reassuring that something's a standard if somebody's pointing it at you. Another thing they said was that Microsoft does not mandate or control the settings on PC firmware that control or enable secure boot from any operating system other than Windows. I, Microsoft will say, if the system is going to boot Windows, it must have this secure boot stuff. But you know, if you want the system to be able to boot anything else, then vendors can do whatever they want. Or alternatively, it's not our fault. You know, if nobody wants to make stuff to run your toy operating system, it's not our fault. So uh, Microsoft's response was one of those nice, completely technically accurate and uh, somewhat disingenuous responses that all companies that are worth anything are really, really good at. So I don't blame Microsoft for this response. It's what I'd have written if I were in their position. Um, on the other hand, I have no idea how I'd get into that position. Nobody <laughs> seems to be willing to give me that much responsibility for some reason. So after that, 
again, we go back to reflecting on our options. Uh, it's around then that I discovered that I'm getting strange liver pains and maybe my original set of plans is not such a great way of solving this problem. So we start thinking about things we can do that don't involve drinking. Um, this is something of a new experience for me. <laughs> but we're looking at trying to come up with multiple simultaneous strategies to work on that. And we're not supposed to just run around screaming. Um, we should run around and scream very loudly, but we should run around in well-defined ways and we should scream well-defined things in an attempt to continue getting enough attention that people continue putting pressure on Microsoft and also uh, trying to come up with things that we can do that hardware vendors would be willing to accept. So we started thinking about the technical options that we had. Um, first was, could we convince vendors to ship a Linux key? And the idea there would be uh, all the hardware is going to ship with a Microsoft key. If we have a Linux key, then we could sign everything with the Linux key. Okay, and the hardware vendors might even be willing to do that. Um, in a lot of cases, the hardware vendors just ship the stuff that the firmware vendors give them, and there's only three real firmware vendors that we need to care about. Uh, so this didn't seem completely implausible. But it did seem likely that some number of hardware vendors would not ship a Linux key. And then you'd have to spend time figuring out which machines could boot Linux and which ones couldn't. The other problem was who would control a Linux key. And if you have this private key that can be used to sign software, and that software can then be booted on the majority of computers, you suddenly become a very attractive malware target. Uh, people who want to run stuff on other people's computers without them knowing would like your key. And we saw this with Stuxnet um, when it was used to infect a bunch of computers in Iran. It took the form, part of it took the form of a driver that was loaded into the Windows kernel and that was legitimately signed with a legitimate Windows hardware vendor signing key that had apparently been physically stolen from this company's offices. Uh, when this key was noticed and blacklisted, suddenly Stuxnet started being signed with a key from the hardware company located next door to the first hardware company. <laughs> uh, we can make assumptions here, like for instance, apparently there are companies who have intelligence agencies who are capable of breaking into buildings and stealing secret keys. And then if one of these keys is compromised, you have to revoke the key, and then anything signed with that key stops booting. Uh, so we needed to find someone who was willing and able to maintain a Linux key and who could maintain this sufficiently securely that if Mossad turned up. That's not really me. <laughs> and we couldn't really think of anyone who did seem like a good fit for dealing with Israeli intelligence. Uh, so, allegedly, I should say, I don't think it's ever been proven that it was Israeli intelligence that were responsible for Stuxnet. Is anyone here working for Israeli intelligence? <laughs> Okay, uh, so even then, if we could securely maintain a Linux key, perhaps we could give an incredible amount of money to an existing security company. Right? Maybe we could go to VeriSign, hand them a large check, and say, okay, uh, you should sign things with this key, and we trust you to keep it securely. Who would get access to that? So okay, easy to say, well, uh, Red Hat, Canonical, Susan, so on should have access. Uh, should Debian? Um, well, okay, maybe Debian should. Uh, okay, how about Mint or um, any of these small specific Linux distributions that are intended to translate Linux into this one dialect that's only spoken by 15 people in a village that has no roads. <laughs> These people exist. They should be able to run Linux. It would be nice if they could continue running Linux. But OK, fine. We say that the person writing their distribution for 15 people can have their stuff signed. Uh, how do we determine whether someone is actually writing a Linux distribution for 15 people in the village or alternatively is actually just writing malware to attack North Korea or whatever? Uh, getting this wrong is a problem and again results in your key being revoked and suddenly Linux stops booting. There's basically every single thing that can go wrong results in nobody can boot Linux anymore and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And then what's the licensing issues? Uh, if we sign something and people can even get source code, rebuild it, they can't sign it themselves. Is that a licensing problem? 
So, alternatively, if a Linux key is not a great idea, how about if we just have a Red Hat key, and then who would get access to the Red Hat key? What are the PR issues of having a Red Hat key be? If Red Hat went to the hardware vendors and said, hey, hardware vendors, uh, here's a key that you need for people to be able to install Red Hat. Fine, Red Hat continues having a business model. Uh, what about Debian? And then what's the PR issues of coming up with a solution that means that you can install Red Hat but not Debian? How about if we could get access to Microsoft Key? Um, if we could get access to Microsoft Key, would other people also be able to get access to Microsoft Key? What would the PR issues of working with Microsoft be? Again, this seems like a slippery slope. If Red Hat, say, could get stuff signed by Microsoft, but uh, Mint couldn't, uh, that would, again, seem like Red Hat being the big Linux company is just making life miserable for everybody else. So, step back. How about if we could avoid having pre-installed keys entirely? If instead of this idea that the machines would have to ship with keys installed, could we work out a way for when you go to install your operating system, you also install a new signing key? And if we can define the mechanism for that, can we also come up with a uh, bunch of vendors who are willing to implement this? And the answers to that were, um, well, I'll get to that. Uh, we could alternately have just given up on Linux and uh, gone back to engaging the pastoral experience. And that was pretty tempting at this point. So, late 2011, Red Hat and Canonical are now both fairly active in the UEFI specification community. Um, with hindsight, we were possibly a few years late to this. But you, know, you live and learn. And we made some proposals require, uh, regarding key management. And the idea was basically that if you put in your CD, then we'll have a defined mechanism for having a key in a specific location. And then it can install the key. Uh, 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 there were reasonable objections to this based on security and the idea that UEFI is not intended to define a policy for user interaction. It's, uh, you can't specify that there must be a button that you can say OK to in UEFI. And even if you could, then which language would it be written in? Uh, yeah. At the time, it was irritating to put forward what we thought was the best compromise proposal and have pushback. With hindsight, I, this was, as far as the hardware vendors and other operating system vendors concerned, uh, not really practical, and I'm okay with that. Uh, so, yeah, this is actually December 2011, um, but I thought that interrupting my presentation to fix my slides before you saw this slide would be a little rude. So pretend that's this December 2011. Microsoft update their Windows 8 requirements. And first thing they add is that on x86 hardware, now strictly speaking, Windows 8 is x86 only. ARM hardware is Windows RT. So when I say Windows 8 hardware, I'm talking about x86. But it must provide a mechanism to disable secure boot, and there must be a mechanism for users to install their own keys. Now, the precise implementation details of those vary. So uh, when we talk about did we win, uh, firstly, we're now at a point where we can expect that x86 hardware can all have Linux installed. But there's no standardized way of handling key management. On some systems, there's a install new key UI option in the firmware. And on some systems, that requires you to have a binary encoded DER file containing the public key. And on other systems, it requires it to be a already formatted UEFI variable dump. And in some cases, these two things are shipped by the same vendor in different product ranges. On other machines, you have to clear the key database entirely. And then in software, you can install new keys and then re-enable secure boot. There's no way of handling this for remote deployments, even if you can on your desktop install a new key before you install Linux. If you've just wrecked 2,000 servers, the last thing you want to do is plug a keyboard and mouse into every single one of them so that you can install a key off a USB stick. And it's going to be a documentation nightmare. There was no way that we could tell people, OK, so to install Linux, you put the CD in, and then you go into the firmware, and then you find an option that sounds probably something like secure boot and then you disable it. And if it pops up a big box saying, by doing this, you're sending your credit card details to the entire universe, uh, you should say, yeah, it's all good. <laughs> and this didn't seem like a particularly attractive option either. But you know, at least we weren't dead now. We had some options. So in February 2012, we head off to Sunnyvale. And Sunnyvale is um, 
where AMD were based, and it's also where we had the UEFI plug fest that spring. Uh, Sunnyvale makes LAX seem like a really happening awesome place. <laughs> and uh, yeah, spring 2012 UEFI plug fest. So this is our first opportunity for face-to-face -face interaction with a lot of the firmware vendors, a lot of the hardware vendors, and also with Microsoft. And we came at this with some level of success. Um, we had. We had uh, a commitment from Microsoft that they would provide open access to the UEFI signing service and that you know, as long as the things you sign aren't used to attack Windows, uh, and if they are used to attack Windows, then the signature might be revoked and then you'll have to produce new media and everything. So uh, and this was what we would expect Microsoft to do with their own stuff if it were compromised in some way. So, this Microsoft can revoke your signature thing, it's fair enough. I, Microsoft are effectively the certificate authority for this industry because they kind of own this industry. And if VeriSign lost control of a key, if a VeriSign customer lost control of a key, you would expect VeriSign to revoke that key even if it caused that customer problems. Uh, so if a Red Hat SSL key were somehow used to attack other systems, we would expect VeriSign to revoke that key. Fair enough. So does this mean that everything's solved? And of course, no, it doesn't mean that anything's solved because otherwise this would be the end of the presentation and I would have to sing and dance for 10 minutes or so to make up the time. Uh, licenses. Standard at this point, Linux bootloader is Grub2. Um, reason for this is that Grub1 was really, really awful and the EFI code for it was even worse. And anyone that says, well, you should have just stuck with Grub1 and continue maintaining that is welcome to do so themselves. <laughs> anyway, GPLv3. Everybody knows that GPLv3 requires you to release your signing keys. Uh, one of the things about GPLv3 was it had this anti tvoization clause, the idea that GPLv3 material must be replaceable by the end user in order to conform to the license, to avoid situations where you sell somebody something that contains free software and they've got the source code, but they can't build anything that will run on that system. Uh, turns out that everyone is completely wrong on this point. So GPLv3 says this uh, installation for, you can fall asleep now. <laughs> but basically what this means is if it's possible to replace it, you don't need to ship the keys. And if the user can, if there's a mechanism for the user to install their own keys and then install something signed with their keys, that's fine. It doesn't need to be possible for them to build something with your keys as long as there's a way of installing their own keys. Alternatively, if it's not a user product, you don't need to ship the keys. And a user product must be a physical object that's basically intended for home use. Uh, software's not a user product. Um, if you sold a computer with Linux pre-installed, this might be a problem. If you just sell Linux, it's not. So uh, we were fine. Uh, Red Hat is not in the hardware industry. Canonical might be a little more upset about this potentially. Uh, but even so, the first option seemed to satisfy that. And uh, we went and asked the copyright holders to make sure the copyright holders were okay with this, because when you're talking about whether you're conforming to the license or something, there's two main concerns. The first is, what was the intent of the copyright holder when they released on this license? And also, what was the intent of the license author? And if you end up in a court case here, the opinions of both may be relevant. Uh, if there's a well-understood license, then the opinions of the license holder are probably more important than the opinions of the copyright holders. If it's in other circumstances, though, if the copyright holder made their interpretation of the license clear in advance, then the copyright holder's interpretation may be more relevant than the license authors. Anyway, we went to copyright holders and we went to the license authors and we said, okay, does this conform to your understanding of the license? And this was made easier in the case of Grub2 because they're actually the same people. The Free Software Foundation is the copyright holder of Grub2 and the Free Software Foundation wrote the GPLv3. Uh, so we asked and we had a nice conversation. We explained how uh, users, we explained what users would have to do in order to be able to run modified versions of the software. We explained that uh, it would be possible for the user to install their own keys even if they might have to jump through a few hoops to do so and they would then be able to sign the object with their keys and they would be able to build modified versions. And sure, everybody assumed that that met the license. So uh, speak to your copyright holders. Speak to your license authors. 
they will give you answers. If you don't like the answers, then get your lawyers to speak to them again. And <laughs> but we got the answer we wanted the first time, so we didn't have to worry about that. User control is important. User freedom is important. Uh, we want users to be able to perform key management, and we wanted it to be possible for distributions to be able to do things even without having to go to Microsoft themselves, because uh, the Microsoft signing thing still involves you having to pay $99 to Symantec. Symantec then call you up to make sure that you're really you, which seems like a low bar. <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, John Malkovich, uh, and here's my phone number. They call this phone number. Is this John Malkovich? Yes. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Identity verified. Uh, but that's still a reasonable bar, and also Symantec won't sell these signing keys if you happen to be living in a nation that the US government forbids them from doing business with. So that might have been a problem. Uh, we can't, the idea of a machine operated key ends up being mooted, and this is possible because the UFI specification allows you to limit variable access to the pre-boot environment. You can create a variable that can only be accessed in the firmware. Uh, the operating system, once running, cannot create or modify these variables. And so keys stored in these can't be modified by the running operating system. And key installation can then be limited to physically present users because the firmware environment is only available to physically present users. And the idea here is that you can just pop up an interface that asks users to install keys and then your bootloader can trust those keys. So the bootloader has to be signed by Microsoft, but the bootloader can then let you install additional keys, and those additional keys can be used to boot Grub or the kernel or whatever. And so SUSE came up with this idea, wrote the code, contributed it, and we merged it into our bootloader. Um, this ends up with a reasonable measure of success. Uh, Ubuntu 12.10 was released in October with secure boot support. It does not have the machine operator key support. So Ubuntu 12.10 doesn't let you install your own keys. Uh, 13.04 should do. Fedora 18, released in January, lets the user modify their own keys. Ubuntu 12.04.2 now also has support for this. Uh, several smaller distributions have picked up on this and is drifting stuff. The next version of OpenSUSE should. Uh, we assume that the next version of RHEL and so on will. Debian, I honestly don't know about, so I think that's still an ongoing discussion in Debian. But we also made available a pre-signed shim, and the idea here is that it's a binary bootloader that I wrote that contains the SUSE MOK code, and it's signed by Microsoft, but it doesn't have any keys in it. So you boot this, and by default, it will then refuse to boot anything else. So you boot this, it pops up a menu saying that I didn't trust what you just asked me to run. And you can then either enroll the hash of the binary you wanted to run, or you can install a key off CD. And the advantage of this is that the distributions can just take this binary and put this on their install media, and then they can generate their own key and they can put the key on there. They don't have to deal with Microsoft. There's no risk of revocation because this key's not automatically trusted by hardware, so they don't have to worry about it being used as a malware vector. And it seems like possibly a reasonable compromise. Some of you may disagree. Uh, that's great if we have that discussion when I've left, ideally. <laughs> That'd be lovely. <laughs> And so what we have left, um, third-party modules, uh, the Linux Foundation, uh, okay, so part of Secure Boot is really that you need to have a completely secure stack. Everything running in kernel space must effectively be trusted, because otherwise you can just turn the kernel into a bootloader. The kernel has this feature called kexec that lets the kernel boot Linux. It's not too difficult to let this, to adapt this so that the kernel will instead boot Windows. Um, it's completely theoretical. Somebody's already written an implementation that allows the Windows kernel to boot Linux. This is not a complicated problem. And so if your signed kernel will boot unsigned code, then you've effectively just written a signed bootloader that will boot malware. So ideally, you have signed kernel modules. But then if you have signed kernel modules, you presumably don't give your key to other companies. And then how do you deal with the fact that there are a bunch of vendors who want to ship signed kernel modules? Uh, sorry, they want to ship kernel modules themselves. Uh, as far as I was concerned, these companies were, they should just get their code into the upstream kernel. But apparently, many of them are unenthusiastic about that for various reasons. So we went to the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation offered to set up a working group to look at this problem. And then not much happened. Less than ideal. 
Uh, so we came up with a couple of ideas. Um, Peter Jones at Red Hat came up with the first basic idea, which is that you could take a vendor, so let's call AMVIDIA, uh, a made-up third-party hardware vendor, <laughs> could generate a key, and they could embed that key within a PECOF binary, and then they could give that PECOF binary to Microsoft, and Microsoft would put it through their signing service, and they'd come up with a signed binary. And then the kernel would be able to verify this binary because it would be signed by a key that the kernel trusts because the kernel trusts all the keys that are in your system firmware and your system firmware probably contains the Microsoft key. And then it would extract the key from inside this binary and then also trust that key. So you'd be able to say, well, I trust this key because it is in an object that was signed by a company whose key I already trust. Uh, Linus was not particularly enthusiastic about this, <laughs> as anyone who saw the discussion last week be aware. Um, yeah. Now, apparently, since we have a kids' track, I'm not actually able to repeat anything that Linus said. <laughs> <laughs> so Linus's proposal was fairly straightforward. It's you do the same as before. You get this binary signed by Microsoft, and then you extract the key from that, and you you know that you can trust that key because it's in an object that's signed by Microsoft's key. You take that key out and then you sign it and then you sign it with a key that the kernel trusts. And that requires a trusted body to perform this role. Um, right now we don't have one and it requires a trusted key in the kernel by default and that would be possibly a problem as well. But you know, maybe we can get something there. It's not a solved problem. Now the Linux Foundation, uh, while we were, by we I mean uh, Red Hat Canonical, SUSE and a couple of other contributors were working on producing the shim loader that's now used by the majority of distributions. The Linux Foundation were writing their own bootloader. And it was initially intended to just be a simple physical presence test. So you would boot it and it would boot anything as long as you pressed Y first. And obviously this wasn't supposed to be an enterprise ready solution, but it was intended to be straightforward. It would let people test uh, what they were doing. But it's kind of had some scope creep since then. Uh, it now supports enrolling hashes. There's a fair amount of uh, functional overlap with Shim. The two can be used for many of the same things, but there's a small amount of functionality the Linux Foundation Loader has that Shim doesn't. There's some functionality that Shim has that the Linux Foundation Loader doesn't. The aim is to merge the two. Um, the only real problem we had here was that the Linux Foundation solution was perceived by many people and basically the entire technology press as being the official solution because the Linux Foundation has the word Linux in their company name. No, not company, whatever, name. Uh, which has led to a certain amount of confusion because there was a lot of, oh, well, now Linux will be able to boot on Windows 8 systems. Um, well, I, I've been doing that for some time. We shipped a bunch of operating systems that can already do that. Fine. We'll merge them. This run will go away. There'll be no more confusion uh, except for all the distributions that then fork it with different functionality. Anyway, where do we end up? So we're now at a point where you can install Linux distributions on systems without disabling secure boot or having to change any other firmware settings. So from the original perspective of it should be possible to install Linux without any more difficulty than before, we got there. Uh, if you're a small distribution or if you're an end user who wants to build your own kernels, you can install and manage your own keys. So we maintained the user freedom that we were concerned about losing. And Microsoft is still the root of trust which is not perhaps ideal. Uh, you are guaranteed to be able to define your own root of trust if you want on your systems, but that involves a certain amount of manual work. You need to remove all the keys, you need to enroll your own keys, and then all your hardware drivers are still signed by Microsoft, so you need to figure out some way around that. Otherwise, you don't get any graphics or USB while you're boosting. So what do we learn? Uh, so even commercial Linux distributions can work well together. Uh, Red Hat, Canonical, and SUSE all cooperated on coming up with a solution that satisfies all their needs. Different companies contributed different parts to it, but we ended up with a single code base that everybody's planning on shipping. So awesome. We can apparently even work with Microsoft. Uh, it's nice. I visited them. Um, I'm here. <laughs> I was not brutally murdered. We gained communica improved communication with vendors. We now have channels of communication between Linux vendors and firmware vendors that we didn't have before because we're operating within the standards bodies. We now actually see system vendors, we see the firmware vendors, we can talk to them when we find issues, we know who to talk to, they know that there are people in the Linux community that they can talk to if they find problems. That's better. <laughs> 
Uh, even when things look bad, we can come up with solutions. They're not always ideal solutions. There are occasionally trade-offs. But overall, compared to the point less than 18 months ago where we thought that the age of Linux being installable on consumer hardware might be over, this is massively better than that. Uh, things have changed a little. Most users are probably not going to notice. Experienced users are going to be able to maintain their freedoms. And we did it without any lawsuits. So, thank you. I think we've time for a couple of questions. Is that why did we get to the point where once we came up with the solution, nobody seemed to be concerned about the fact that Microsoft had done this in the first place? And the answer is, well, this is a capitalist society. <laughs> Microsoft have a great deal of money, and therefore they get to do what they want. Yeah. The uh, idea that we might want Microsoft to behave in a socially responsible manner sounds awfully like communism to me. <laughs> so, right, it's just the narrative is, well, okay, if Microsoft are trying to use their power to actually put someone out of business, that's considered as a bad thing. If Microsoft's compromised just enough that other people can remain in business, then who cares? That's just how people do business. Um, I'm not a great fan of that, but that's basically how things work. Uh, my misunderstanding, or does this impact uh, DKMS? This impact DKMS, yes. Uh, the idea, if you have Secure Boot enabled, and if you want to build your own third-party modules, say using DKMS, those modules will not load unless they're signed by a trusted key. And the only, there are two ways around that. The first is that the shim loader actually has an option where you can disable enforcement. Uh, so you type in the command, you reboot the machine, the next time shim comes up, it prompts you to enter uh, a password. And you do that, and then you say disable secure boot verification. So this is something that would be difficult to fool people into doing, and it's something that can't be done automatically. And um, once that's done, then signature verifi verification is turned off. You lose the security benefits, but you can sign your own stuff. The alternative is that you generate your own key, you enroll your own key, and somebody patches the KMS such that if there's a key there, it'll sign stuff with that key. And then everything works. Uh, good time for open source hardware. Yeah, um, seriously, the problem here is if Microsoft didn't dominate the hardware scene, then Microsoft wouldn't be able to do this. Long term, the only way of preventing this kind of thing happening again is to ensure that Microsoft don't have that level of power. Back. What about KXX? Can you use KXX? Can you use KXX? Right now, no KXX disabled if you're in a secure boot environment. If you're using the pack set that we suggest that people use, there's ongoing work to come up with solutions for that. What if MOSFET gets hold of Microsoft Key? Well, <laughs> yeah, um, I just think we have to assume that they'll use it responsibly. <laughs> Done. Yeah. So the specifications, actually, uh, to begin with, we had the problem that it was only possible to uh, sign a binary with a single key. So if you signed your binary with a Microsoft key, then it wouldn't boot on a system that had some alternative root of trust. The specification, uh, that's being worked on. 
um, a, I can't really talk about, I'm no longer part of a company that is working on this stuff, but I also can't really talk about stuff that's going on within the working groups, but there's interest in fixing that problem. Red Hat still is involved in this. Um, we can think of Red Hat as a faceless corporate entity, but honestly, Red Hat is committed to user freedom. I don't think Red Hat would stop fighting for user freedom just because I'm not working there anymore. Um, I think that would be a kind of awful situation. Other Linux vendors should also get involved with this. I believe the Linux Foundation is looking at trying to be involved in the standards process. Uh, potentially, if the Linux Foundation is able to get involved, then perhaps long-term organizations like the Free Software Foundation may be able to. I think there's some issues with the UEFI bylaws that make it difficult for nonprofits to be in there, but sure. Um, so, unfortunately, I think we're basically out of time. You mentioned, you mentioned specifically x86 hardware. So what about ARM hardware? What about ARM hardware? The situation is that ARM hardware sold with Windows RT is required to be locked down and must not have an option for the user to disable this. This is a gross affront to user freedom. It's also a gross affront to user freedom that the market appears completely happy with because the vast majority of ARM hardware sold comes with locked bootloaders. If you buy an ARM phone, typically you can't install your own operating system on it until somebody's found a way of breaking the bootloader. iPads will not run arbitrary software. Uh, you need to fight. The entire jailbreaking routing thing for iPads, that's basically the idea that the iPad can run something that isn't Apple authorized operating system images. And Apple's getting increasingly good at preventing that from happening. I think the likelihood is that the first generation Windows RT hardware will probably all end up being broken one way or another, and there will be ways for people to install their own stuff on this. Long term, they're going to figure out how to prevent that. And we shouldn't stand for that. But we shouldn't just criticize Microsoft for that. Everybody in the industry is doing it. Uh, we need to focus on the fact that there's an industry-wide issue that devices, as opposed to computers, are lockable and that's fine with people. We need a cultural shift there. Uh, we need to target Microsoft for that, but we also need to target Apple, we need to target HTC, Sony, all these companies that ship devices where you can't modify.